Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Happy Friday. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. We talked about Colette all this week. We sure did. Yes. I am 99.999% sure that when we were in Paris and uh, I took a little trip off of our official planned things to go to Père Lachaise that I went to her grave. I cannot find photographic evidence of this. <laughs> and in, uh, in my pictures, I'm pretty sure I did that, though. I do have a picture of, there's a map as you enter that shows you where uh, various notable people are buried. And I definitely have a picture showing me on the map where Colette's burial was. So that I have. I had a cat named after her. Yeah? (laughs) Was your cat a mess? No. Well, sort of. uh, This is a little bit sad, but you may remember because this cat passed when I was... Oh, uh, yeah. When we were working together, we had not had her for, for very long, and we didn't know that when we adopted her, she was quite sick. Um, yeah. So we didn't have her for a very long time. Uh, but she was very beautiful and kind of a hilarious drama queen, so it seemed sort of perfect for her. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when that happened, but I had forgotten Yeah, what her name was. Yeah, so it was Colette. Yeah. Colette. Um, one, there are various things that, came up in research that did not make their way into the episode, which always happens. One of the things that particularly stuck out to me, though, was that um, when she was writing Cherie, which a lot of people mistakenly believe was about, like, inspired by Bertram, which, no, she wrote Cherie before they ever met. Right. Or at least had had at least written a bunch of it and started publishing it seri- serially before they ever met but her husband and his father, Henri de Juvenel, he was not a fan of that book. And so as I was, I was like, was he psychic? <laughs> did he have a premonition? Uh, or did he otherwise think this book suggested things about his wife that he found troubling? I sure found that. I don't even like using the word relationship for no, it. No, it's like, weird. Like, clearly, at the time, ev- that's how everybody was describing it, and they saw it as a relationship, but it was it was gross. Um, a lot of stuff she said about it was gross. Her, it's, it's way more obvious from accounts at the time that a lot of people found a lot of the things that um, Wheelie did in their relationship to be really gross. Um, so it's like... Aspects of that, I think, have have a lot of the same connotations then as now. But I think Colette and Bertrand has like a slightly different nuance today than it did at the time that just makes it particularly upsetting. Yes. And I do wonder if some of Henri's issue with it had more to do with like while it was I don't want I don't even know if accepted is the right word. More common for older men to date much younger women or mm-hmm. even girls, the flip was not always the case. And I wonder if that was part of why he had issue with it. Maybe. But then it also is, uh, it almost seems like she manipulated that fact and the idea that she would not ever be seen as predatory in that whole relationship. Yeah. Because it's not as though he came to her and was like ardently like, I am in love with you. As inappropriate as that would still be by today's standards, those sorts of relationships have certainly played out where a a younger man pursues an older woman. It seems like she very much was driving the bus. Yeah, she was at least very heavily steering the bus. Um, And there are accounts that make him, that sort of describe him as more actively involved in pursuing her at the beginning, or at least feeling captivated by her in some ways but like yeah it's still it's still gross it's very gross 100 percent um also the all of the part about how it really does seem like both she and maurice were almost oblivious to what was happening and i mean surely they were not the only people who were almost oblivious to what was happening in france and in paris during the 
uh, the Nazi occupation, but we have talked about so many other people on the show who were more like, we have got to get out, and we have got to get out now. Yeah. Um, and it was incredibly late in the game when they started being like, we might need to get out of here. Well, and I think this kind of ties back to that quote we included at the end from Maurice, where he said that for 30 years, you know, he lived in a fairyland with her. And I think that's, it's not entirely uncommon to read about uh, people in certain social strata or even artistic social strata to just kind of feel themselves outside of any of the realities that other people go through, which is pretty yeah. obvious, you know, considering that she didn't really engage with any of the politics of her life ever. No. But yes, it does seem incredibly foolish in retrospect. And also, like, why are why are you publishing in these papers that are yeah. actively harmful to the person your husband is? Like, why? So, so many things that have gotten into that to some degree are like, even if we're charitable, this was bad. Like, and I think I said pretty much that. But, like, we don't actually know if we need to be charitable. We ha- we know so little about her personal thoughts about her decision-making process. Right. Um, so it's like being charitable is extending her a, wh- a whole lot of benefit of the doubt. <laughs> right. It's a, it's a great deal of grace for someone we don't, we don't yeah. know. Yeah. And I don't really know um, if Maurice left his own perspective on what it was like to be living in Paris during that time and, like, being made to wear a yellow star. We don't really know. If, I don't... Maybe this is written somewhere, but I didn't find it. Like, I, we don't know if Colette's characterization of him seeming almost unbothered by that, like, if that was right or not, or if that was also kind of flippant and oblivious. Man, I just have such complicated feelings about her. <laughs> yes. Uh, and when I was doing the research, I was like, yeah, you're going to become a mime and start, like, publishing stories yourself so you can get away from your awful husband who's being really exploitive of your, your create. Wait, you're going to do what? But what are I, you doing now? I'm sorry, what? Can I just tell you, reading and, like, talking about the constant ebb and flow of people's various romantic partners in and out of wedlock who is jealous of whom it's i'm like man yeah this is exhausting i'm too vanilla uh, for all yes. of this <laughs> yeah um i watched the uh the recent biopic starring Kira Knightley. Uh-huh. For fun really as <laughs> i was working on this um and a couple of things just stuck out to me. One, it just, it was constantly funny to me that it is a movie about France, about someone who was a national icon in France. Um, everybody has a British accent. Oh, right. And, like, I, it, would, it would have been incredibly weird if everybody had a French accent also, but the fact that it just, in so many ways, um, felt almost like a British period piece, which it definitely was not. Like, it, that just kind of tickled me. Um, so as I was watching it, and I was sort of, you know, knowing at that point, having researched her whole entire life, knowing that the uh, the movie was not going to at all cover the whole entire life, I, as I was watching it, I was like, I'm pretty sure this movie is going to stop before we get to the part where there was this love triangle between... Missy and Auguste and Colette, and also Colette started sleeping with her married boss. Like, and I was just like, this is such a gigantic tangle. Yeah. And feels like so much work to me. Uh, Also, that movie, while I enjoyed watching that movie, it definitely makes, it's very sanitized in terms of the ending, like a lot of movies like this, there's a series of title cards at the end kind of, like, suggesting what happens after the action of the movie is over. And it almost reads like Colette and Missy lived happily ever after for many more years. And that is 100% not no. what happened. No. Yeah. Whew, exhausting. <laughs> I think it came up in our Georges Sand episode, but you mentioned, you know, when she started wearing uh, trousers that that was still illegal. Mm-hmm. 
it was illegal until the 20 teens in France. Yeah. Technically on the books. Just, I always find that hilarious. Obviously, no one was pursuing that law and like right, holding right. anyone accountable, but it didn't get revoked until the 20 teens, which I find hilarious. It was one of those things where the law was more used to harass people whose, whose behavior was yes. being seen as a problem in some other way. Um, yes. So someone like Missy, who had some question marks around things like gender and sexuality. There might actually be not as many question marks. There are question marks in my mind just because, like, I don't have that much information about Missy. Right. Uh, But, like, definitely things like those laws about trousers were being used to harass people. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, that law is from the 1700s, but I just, as a funny factoid, I think it's fascinating that it was still there, lurking, if you have traveled to Paris in the 2000s. (laughs) Up until the 20 teens. I can't remember if it was 2013 or 2015 that it finally came off the books, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very recently, you were also in violation of the law if you were a woman wearing pants. Right. Ugh. My only other comment is ridiculous. Okay. Maurice just barely didn't live long enough to see Star Wars. That's all. That's all. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Like, oh, Maurice, if you had hung on four more months, you would have had your mind blown. Yeah. Yeah. I'm similarly, uh, I have not read either of Maurice's uh, memoirs. I am curious. He he fascinates me a little bit. Um, it really does seem like his, their relationship seems like it was really good for Colette. She, in terms of like, are, is your life going to be a continual factory of chaos and drama like <laughs> seems like not so much anymore once she and Maurice got together yeah um and the things that I have read about the like the way he talked about her seemed really loving and devoted um and so maybe at some point I will dig up copies of translations of those memoirs um apparently the one about his becoming a father at age 71 is really touching um yeah I think If you think about his level of just absolute adoration and devotion to her, it might inform a little bit of, like, why she would think he had no problem wearing a yellow star under the Nazis. Because I'm sure he would not have told her he was troubled. He never wanted to trouble her in any way. Yeah, that makes sense. And only take care of her. I could 100% see him being like, no, it's fine. It probably wasn't. How could it be? But to her, oh, he's yeah. fine. He said he was fine. Yeah. Well, and the same about his being in that internment camp. Like uh-huh. his internment camp made it sound definitely very unpleasant. He probably was cushioning that also. Yes. In, to protect him. Yeah. Hundred percent. Yeah. Especially considering like the complex nature of her using her influence to secure his release, and that having been done through channels that were not cool. No. Um, I think that probably also dampened his willingness to say anything negative about any of it, right? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to make waves. I don't want to call attention. I'm not rocking any boats. I'm stirring zero snakes. Like, just everything's fine, honey. Everything is fine. I'm good. I'm with you. Maurice becomes the really interesting one in this story. To yeah, me by the yeah. End. <laughs> I'm very, I'm, I'm interested at some point, probably to to learn more about him. Um, I also will confess that I, I sent you the quotes that he said about her. Yes. <laughs> uh, because, of course, it makes me weepy-deepy. Yeah, I found them very touching. So the first beautiful. one that we read that was like, and then her work became more settled, I was like, that almost comes out as a little patronizing to me, but I still was very touched by it. Oh, see, it does it to me because I know yeah. exactly what that experience is to be a wild animal and then find mm-hmm. your person and then suddenly you feel much more serene. Yeah. <laughs> so it did not feel at all patronizing. I'm like, yes, that's an accurate description of what can happen if, if you meet the right person. <laughs> well, happy early Valentine's Day, everybody. <laughs> Woo! Mixed bag. <laughs> Colette, a mixed bag. Maybe that's what we should have titled these episodes. <laughs> We can have custom conversation hearts printed that just say mixed bag and it'll be perfect. Perfect. (laughs) Well, whatever's happening on your weekend, I hope it's good. If it's not good, I hope you're able to take a moment 
maybe get something that's a little treat in some way. Maybe have just a minute to yourself. Uh, We'll be back tomorrow with Saturday Classic. We'll be back next week with brand new episodes. And you can subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you like to get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 